watercolour painting today I've got five things that you should probably stop doing. Welcome back to my channel if you are new here my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing tuition mixed media even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too so please do consider subscribing if you click the bell icon you can get notified every time I have a new video for you I make at least one free video a week here on a Thursday on YouTube with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So in this video, I'm going to give you five things that you should probably stop doing in your watercolour painting, particularly if you are a beginner. Now, please don't sound off in the comments and get absolutely furious with me if you don't agree with these things. It's fine. This is just the internet. I'm not even a real person, to be honest. So let's start a discussion in the comments, not a big old row. If you don't agree with these things, it's absolutely fine. I'm not saying that I'm right about this. These are just my opinions and my experience from 20 years of teaching beginners to paint in watercolours. I'm actually going to go through this list from sort of things that just irritate me a little bit down to things that really, really make me bang my head against the wall. And the number one thing that I would like you to stop doing it's a fashion thing. In other words, it's not something that I ever saw beginners do maybe five years ago. It's a recent thing. So do keep watching right the way through to the end. I'm going to go through these five things with you. This is not about making anybody feel bad about what they're doing. If you're a beginner and you haven't done any of these things, well, um, that's quite amazing because I know I did several of them. And remember, if you confess in the comments, if you fess up to any of these, I will give you absolution. You are forgiven for your sins. So let's start with the first thing that I think that beginners in particular should stop doing with their watercolour paintings. So the first thing that I would like you to do is stop throwing backgrounds in your paintings as an afterthought. You didn't plan it at the beginning, you just get to the end of your painting and suddenly think, oh, I should add a background. I see it all the time on Facebook groups, you know, people come into the group and they say, I've done this picture, I'm really pleased with it, should I put a background in it? Now I want to be completely clear, it's not wrong to put a background in at the end of the painting, it's not even wrong to put a background in that you hadn't planned at the beginning if you're a fairly experienced artist. And here's the thing, Backgrounds are quite difficult, especially for beginners. So when you start painting, it may be that you paint something where you've got sort of a lot of detail, a lot of small details. So there's not a lot of sort of um, large washes or large areas that the watercolour paint can really, really look awful if you get it wrong. So you do your bird, your butterfly, your piece of fruit, whatever it is that you've painted. And then suddenly you think, well, maybe this would look better with a background. Now, what I would say about backgrounds is, first of all, you should plan them from the beginning of your painting. So when you start painting something, you want to consider right at the beginning if you're going to add a background or not. Now, it isn't even wrong to change your mind as you go through because a plan is just a plan with a painting and often it's necessary to adjust. So if you didn't plan a background at the beginning, and I do this myself sometimes, and you get to the end and you think it may look better with a background, now that's something that you could do. If you are fairly experienced, if you know how to do wet in wet, if you know how to do flat washes, if you know how to do a graduated wash, if you have some proficiency with painting over large areas, then go ahead and add your background. However, if you've just started painting and you don't really have all those techniques under your belt, then putting a background in can easily ruin your picture. Now, even when you do plan a background from the beginning, whether you add the background before the subject or after the subject, really, really depends on the, uh, the subject and the tonal contrast and exactly what you're painting. That's something that you'll get to understand how to make those decisions right from the beginning. But if you are that beginner, and particularly if you're thinking about putting a flat wash in behind. In other words, if you've got your subject, your object in the middle of the page and you want to get flat colour all the way around it, this is probably the hardest technique that you can do. It sounds really, really simple to add a flat background, but it's one of the hardest things to do in watercolour. It's particularly hard to do it around a complex object. Now, I do teach this in my basic watercolour techniques for beginners course. There's also lots of free information on the internet. So if you are a complete beginner, what I suggest you do is either to take a course and learn how to do backgrounds, or you can watch some free tutorials. But what I would do is take the pressure off yourself. So practice your backgrounds first. In other words, practice backgrounds when it doesn't matter. Get yourself some practice watercolour paper. There's a reasonable standard but isn't going to make you cry if you have to throw it away and just draw something in the middle of the paper draw a circle draw a wiggly shape draw anything and have a go at putting backgrounds in this is something you can do for a specific painting actually if you're thinking about putting a background in behind that bird that you've done that looks really really lovely get another piece of paper draw a really scruffy you know cartoon bird and have a go at the background if it doesn't work out then stop when you finish a nice painting, I would always default to not putting a background in that you haven't planned from the beginning. I've seen it end in disaster so many times. 
So the second thing I would like you to stop doing is just dipping randomly into all of your paint colours when you do a painting. You always want to be working within some kind of limited palette. Now the expression limited palette has several meanings actually and for some artists it means that they do every single painting with perhaps just a small limited palette. A lot of oil painters do this. I know an oil painter who paints all of his paintings with just eight colours. And then you get sets that you can buy and you get something called a split primary set. I have one myself, details in the description if you're interested in that. And what a split primary set does is it gives you warm and cool versions of each of the primary colors so that you can mix a wide range of colors. It's a fantastic way to start out if you are a beginner. However, as you become more experienced, what you're going to notice is that not every color can be mixed from a limited set like that. As I said, it's a great place to start when you're a beginner because it stops everything being overwhelming. It's how I started, it's how I recommend everybody start. But as you become more experienced, you realize that there are some colors that you just can't mix from that primary set. And things like earth browns, much better to buy those colors individually. And that's when you get addicted to buying paint colors. And you buy tons of colors and now you've got hundreds of colors. Again, nothing wrong with this. I have hundreds of colors myself. But the problem comes when you just start chucking them randomly into your paintings. And this can happen more often if you've got pan paints or if you've got tube paints that you've um, set out in a very large palette and sort of put them all out to dry. What can happen is because you have so many colors available, you know, you haven't got to get the lid off the tube every time they're all in front of you, you've got your paintbrush, it's so tempting just to keep dipping into this, 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 this. But what I want you to do is to consider using a limited palette for each painting. So that's not a set of colors that you use for each painting. It's not restrictive. You can still use your hundreds of colors, but it's more a matter of not using hundreds of colors within one painting. So what I like to do is at the beginning, I sort of look at my painting and I think about the colors that might work best for this painting. I make sure that I've got at least one of every primary color. If I've got some very strong darks, I'm going to need at least one staining color. I start out, I swatch a few colors and I might end up with maybe four, five, six colors that I'm going to start with. Thereafter, I try to complete the whole painting with those colors. If I get to a point where nothing that I can mix is going to give me the color that's in the painting, then I'll add another color in. But what I don't do is just randomly dip in and out of all the colors. The problem with doing that is not only can you end up with a big old sort of muddy mess, you can also end up with something that just doesn't look harmonious, it doesn't hang together. Now every woman knows that you don't wear bright red lipstick on the same day that you wear a mini skirt and a low cut top and stilettos. And most men know that on the day when you decide to be a bit creative and wear those lime green socks, you don't wear the purple shirt and the red tie and the yellow handkerchief and the green coat. So you see what I'm saying here. Everything in life has a color palette. Every day, every landscape has a palette. Everything is bathed in the same light. Every person has a color palette too. And that's why certain colors suit us and other colors don't. So how many colors are in a limited palette? Well, there's no right answer. If you're doing a sunset, you may only need three or four colors. I rarely use more than that because the whole landscape is bathed in the same light. However, if you're painting a garden on a sunny day and it's full of different brightly colored flowers, of course you might need more colors. You may need lots of greens just to make the greens look interesting. So this is not about restricting yourself. It's not about saying you can't use certain colors. It's about having a plan for your colors. It's about trying to limit the number of colors that you use within a painting just to make it look more harmonious. Now, not everybody does this, but if this is you, if you've got your pan paints or your tube paints that dried out, and as you paint, you just find yourself dipping in and out and in and out of every color, I want you to try instead to use a limited palette. You're gonna find you get a much more atmospheric, harmonious look to all of your paintings. At this point, if you're finding this video useful, can I please ask you to click the thumbs up, the like button. YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. So if you click like, share, subscribe, or even leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people and I can teach more people how to paint. So what is the third thing that I would like you to stop doing to your watercolor paintings and it's masking fluid. I want you to stop shoving loads of masking fluid on your paintings. Now again, to be clear, I use masking fluid myself. It's an amazingly helpful tool. In a small range of situations, it can really make the difference and give you success and help you to paint things that otherwise wouldn't be possible. However, I've been teaching classes out in the real world. I've taught classes, I've taught workshops, I've taught painting holidays. And if I had a pound or a dollar for every time I had seen a painting ruined by masking fluid, I would be incredibly wealthy. Spoiler alert, I'm not incredibly wealthy. 
Now, one of the conversations that sometimes goes on between students at my classes is when one student is trying to sort of reserve a white area and the student next to them, it's almost like watching a drug dealer actually, the student next to them will say, I've got this thing, I've got this thing, you're gonna love it, it's gonna make you feel great. And they tell them about masking fluid and my heart kind of sinks because as a beginner, the idea that you can put this thing on your paper and reserve your whites and it just works perfectly every time, spoiler alert, it doesn't, is incredibly intoxicating and addictive and some people are addicted to masking fluid. Now here's the problem with masking fluid. Under most circumstances, it just doesn't look realistic. It is very, very hard edged. It's quite difficult to use. If you put too much on, you're very, very likely to tear your paper. And it is far from the only way to mask out whites or to get whites into your paintings. As I said, I use masking fluid myself and it is a good tool when used under the right circumstances. But I want you to kind of default to not using it. I want you to think initially about other ways of reserving those whites. And if those whites are soft edged, and I'm talking clouds, I'm talking waves, I want you to consider is there a better way of doing it because it absolutely never looks natural. And as I said at the beginning of the video, this is something that I've done myself. I remember doing a painting of sort of waves breaking on the shore and using masking fluid to get those waves, like all of the shapes correct. And it looks absolutely awful because waves just don't have those crisp edges. Now, could you use it in small amounts for window frames on tiny houses? Yes, that's a great use for it. What about daisies, those crisp edge shapes in your flower beds? Again, another good use for it. You can even splatter with it. It can be used in a way that's very subtle. And if you do choose to use masking fluid, you should be applying it in very small amounts. That's all it was ever designed for. It is not designed for blocking out large amounts of your paper, and that's when you'll get into trouble with it. It's designed for small, tiny, fine details. It isn't easy to apply with whatever tool you're using. And it's really important that you apply it very, very intentionally. Practice it on a scrap of paper first, and if possible, default to not using it. And as I said, the amount of paintings that I've seen ruined by careless over-application of masking fluid just doesn't bear thinking about. At number four on my list, and this is one that I find immensely frustrating because it's just so misguided, and that's starting out as a beginner and trying to learn loose painting. It's a bit like going to your first music lesson and saying, today I'd like to play a symphony, please. Or going to your first cookery lesson and saying, well, I'd like to make a souffle with a raspberry sauce, please. When you don't even know how to make toast. There are two main reasons why beginners try to start with loose painting. I'm going to go through both of them and explain why it's a very, very bad idea and completely misguided. So the first reason people try to start with loose painting is just that they've seen other people do it. They love those techniques. It looks fantastic. But it's a bit like me going and buying a dress because I saw it on Beyonce and thinking it's going to look just as good on me. Let's face it, I'm probably going to be disappointed. And what you have to understand about loose painting is it's not a place that you start. It's a place that you get to. And it's the same with abstraction. Loose painting at its best is an expression by very, very experienced artists who have gradually refined and reduced the amount that they need to put on the paper, the same with abstraction. It's not something where you should try and jump to the end of the process. And as I've said in other videos, trying to copy someone else's style does not work. Loose painting is often an expression of the artist's personality. If you're someone like me who um, likes to be quite neat and tidy, you may find that you never reach the point of loose painting and that's fine. Perhaps you're meant to be a botanical painter, but even if you are meant to be a loose painter, it's not the place where you start, it's the place where you progress to after many years experience. Now let's look at the second reason why people try to start with loose painting and that's because they think it's easy. Well, look at that. I won't have to learn to draw. I won't have to worry about color mixing if I just paint loosely. I actually had a lady years ago that found me on the internet because I'm an art tutor and phoned me up and said, could you teach me to paint, please? I'd like to learn abstract. Now, this was a little bit unusual. And I said, well, you know, why would you like to learn abstract painting? And she said, because I can't draw. So please don't be fooled by those beautiful loose paintings that you see in watercolors. They're not done by people that have no control of the medium. They're done by people who are masters of the medium. So what should you do instead of trying to paint loosely or trying to paint abstract or even trying to paint botanical? You shouldn't start with any of those things. You should simply start with understanding the medium. Start by understanding what watercolors are and how they work. I have many, many free videos on this channel about these subjects. Learn composition, learn color mixing, learn techniques. Techniques are really important with watercolor. Watercolor is a very, very technique driven medium. 
You have to be able to control it. You have to understand about water levels. Again, I have many, many free videos. I've also got a complete beginner's course, link in the description if you need it. And most of all, learn to draw because painting is just drawing with a brush. And please don't be fooled when you look at those masterpieces of loose painting. Please don't be fooled into thinking that that's a good place to start. You wouldn't start learning the piano by playing a concerto, you'd start by learning scales. Divorce yourself from worries about painting style and just learn to understand how the paints work and how to manipulate and control them on the paper. And if you're a complete beginner, please don't try and start with loose painting. It's not the journey, it's the destination and it may not even be your destination. Now, if I'd made this video five years ago, trying to paint loosely would probably have been the top thing that I would want you to stop doing. However, in the last few years, we have a new contender, and this is splattering your painting without any reason. Yes, it's actually a thing now where people get a paintbrush or a toothbrush and for no reason whatsoever do a load of splatters on their work. Now again, splattering is a perfectly good technique. I use it in my own paintings. Very useful for things like texture and beaches. I've done lots of splattering in my work. But this, in a way, is similar to the last one. It's just become really, really faddy, really fashionable. If I never see another painting of a Technicolor cow or a hummingbird with loads of splatters all over it, I will be very, very happy. It's become a complete fad of fashion. I think what happened is that one or two people developed this style as their own inherent style and did it very, very well. And then every single beginner was hugely attracted to it and decided to do it in their own work, usually very, very badly. It's a risky thing to do, isn't it? But I see it all the time. Again, I see it in Facebook groups. Beginners will come in and they say, well, I've done this painting. Shall I put a few splatters on it? And I think to myself, well, why not? Why not make a cake and then just drop it on the floor? Or perhaps you should clean your car and then run a key down the side. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with the splattering technique. And it has been used by some artists to really, really beautiful effect. But what you're doing here, again, is you're just taking someone else's style and trying to inflict it on your own work. If you don't understand the medium that well, you don't have that much control of the paintbrush when you're painting, let alone when you're splattering, and you don't really understand how to use these splatters effectively, then chucking a load of paint on top of your picture isn't going to look very effective. At worst, it can ruin your painting. In the worst case scenario, you can ruin a perfectly good painting. Best case scenario, you're gonna make your work look like everything else that's currently on Instagram. Please, please, please stop randomly chucking paint on top of perfectly good paintings. Concentrate, as I said, on learning to paint, on understanding the medium and finding your own style and if you get to the end of one of your paintings you're quite pleased with it and you find yourself thinking shall i just get a paintbrush with some wet paint on it and chuck some splatters across this piece of work please just stop put down your paintbrush do what the british do go and have a nice cup of tea instead so before you leave this video remember absolution for your sins will be granted in the comments section you can also tell me if you disagree with me there please feel free to do that without throwing a load of abuse. This is just one person's opinion. It's absolutely fine for you to have a different opinion. If you do want to get more control over your watercolors and learn more techniques and develop your own style, please do have a look in the video description. I have some free downloadable PDF guides that you can grab there for no money whatsoever. I also have some paid courses, including my most popular course, which is the watercolor basic techniques for beginners. You can start right from the beginning, right from getting things like flat washes and graduated washes really, really under control. Because once you understand and can control the medium, finding your own style and developing as an artist will become much, much easier. Now we started this video talking about backgrounds. If you'd like more help with your backgrounds, I've got a video you're going to find really, really useful. You can watch that video right now.